You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. From our studios on the campus of Murray State University in Murray, Kentucky, this is a Bible answer. Thanks so much for watching today. My name is Mike McDaniel, and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. We have three gospel preachers with us to help answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hi, I'm Dr. Brad Harab. work with an organization called Focus Press. I'm in Franklin, Tennessee. Travel about 42 weekends a year doing cultural apologetics. I'm Wade Webster. I preach for the South Haven Church of Christ in South Haven, Mississippi. I'm David Lemons. I preach for the Maple Hill Church of Christ in Benton, Kentucky. We're so glad these brethren could be with us today to answer your questions. Our first question today goes to Brother Harab. Brother Harab, how did the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls help to fortify our confidence in the integrity of the Scriptures? Brother Harab. Thanks, Mike. The Dead Sea Scrolls were basically a, a bomb going off in the, the skeptics' camp. And let me explain exactly why I would say that. For many, many years, skeptics would, would poke holes and say, you know, we don't have a, a good authority. We don't know for sure that what we're reading is accurate. In fact, they, they said the manuscripts that we had only went back so far. Ironically, King James Version of the Bible, 1611. 1611. Now, fast forward to the years 1900, year 2000. 1900 people are starting to, to poke fun. They're making fun of God's Word, even prior, obviously prior to that. But all the while, sitting in a cave, there was evidence. There was proof. And in 1947, that evidence began to speak, so to speak. Young boy, he was looking for a lost goat. Looking around some, some caves, he threw a rock into one of those caves, thinking maybe that this particular goat was there, it would scare it out. And he didn't hear the animal. Instead, what he heard was the breaking of clay pots. He scrambled up into that particular cave, and, and that young man made probably the biggest discovery when it comes to the Bible and archaeology, the Dead Sea Scrolls several hundred clay pots. What they believe had happened was there was a, a battle going on. The Romans were, were starting to advance. This Quayman group of people preserved their scriptures. You've got to realize this was back before the days of computers, inkjet printers. Those scriptures were very valuable. It had taken men painstaking hours in order to put that on papyrus. They put these scriptures and other documents into the clay pots. They sealed them up. They hid them in the cave, probably suspecting that at some point they would come back. Well, in 1947, that young man discovered all of those clay jars, and he discovered the fact that there were scriptures in there. Now, fast forward to the year today, and you realize that having been able to analyze what was on those particular pieces of papyrus. Lo and behold, 1611, the Bible was translated into English. 1947, we get manuscripts that are even older than what was used to translate the King James Version. And lo and behold, they match up beautifully. For instance, you, you've got almost the entire book of, of Isaiah that is just word for word what we find in the King James Version, giving us proof that, yes, what we hold today is precisely what God intended for us to hold. You see, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, what they really are is confirmation that what we've been referring to as God's Word was translated accurately, precisely, and that you and I have precisely what God intended us for us to have. Now, Ask yourself a simple question. A God who can create the universe, do you not think that He can adequately get you His Word 
into your hands in modern times. You see, friends, the Dead Sea Scrolls helps us to understand, yes, the Bible is accurate. And the question remains, are we going to actually heed it? And that'll be for another day. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Very interesting story. Our next question to Brother Webster. Brother Webster, why do people in the churches of Christ not speak in tongues? Brother Webster. Properly understood, tongues are languages. In the church at South Haven where I preach, we have people who speak a number of languages. We have one man who speaks Spanish. We have another man who speaks four different African languages. We have those that can speak a little in German and a little in French. We have many English speakers. They speak in tongues in the sense that they speak in different languages. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, we find that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the apostles. And it gave them the power to speak in other tongues. People were amazed on that day because they knew that the apostles were Galileans. And yet they were speaking in languages that all of these different nations that were represented on that day could hear and understand. So we are introduced to the fact that tongues, as the Bible is using that term, refers to languages. On the day of Pentecost, it had reference to languages that the apostles had never studied, that they had never learned. The Holy Spirit was enabling them to speak in a language that they had never studied so that the gospel could be presented to individuals from those countries and from those various languages. Later on, of course, one of the miraculous spiritual gifts was the gift of tongues. And so there were Christians who could speak in tongues. Again, it had reference to languages. It had reference to languages that they had never learned. Now, when we think about the reason for the tongues in Acts chapter 2, we think about the reasons why the early Christians were given the gift of tongues, we see that there were different reasons. The apostles were confirming the word, and tongues was evidence of that in Mark chapter 16. It convinced the audience that these men were guided by God, that God was speaking through them, that God was delivering His message through them. For the early Christians, it was more about edification. It was more about building up the early church during the very first days of its existence. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 7 and 8 that the day is coming when tongues are going to cease. He even gives us a time frame for that, explaining that when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. The perfect that he has reference to there is the completed revelation, the Word of God. And when revelation was completed, tongues were no longer needed. They were no longer needed to confirm the Word. They were no longer needed to edify or build up the church. The Word was capable of doing that at that point. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, Paul says, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. And so the Word of God is able to build us up. It's able to edify the church. The Word has been confirmed. It has been completed. And so the need for tongues today is, is not, not needed anymore because God has completed His revelation. I can honestly say that I wish that the Holy Spirit could empower me to speak in a language that I've not studied or that I've not learned. Later this year, I plan to take a mission trip to Peru and I wish that I could speak Spanish. It would make my life so much easier while uh, I am there. And yet, if I want to speak Spanish, I'm going to have to study that language. I'm going to have to learn that language. I'm not going to be able to do that in any other way. So this question is concerning why do people in the churches of Christ not speak in tongues? And I've explained that tongues are languages and that we do speak various languages. But I would point out that it's not only people in churches of Christ that are not enabled to speak in languages they've never learned today, but people everywhere, religious people everywhere, no one can do this today. The Holy Spirit is not empowering anyone to do this today. And so it is not just churches of Christ that are removed or limited from this gift. It is all people today that are limited from this because it's no longer needed because we have the Word of God. And so those who are claiming to be speaking in tongues today, first of all, they may not be speaking a language at all. 
But if they are speaking a language, it is a language that they have studied and a language that they are, have learned and not a language that is being given to them uh, through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for this question. Thank you, Brother Webster. It's important to understand there in Acts the second chapter that when the apostles were speaking in tongues, they were speaking in languages and they heard in the tongue or language in which they were born. Those were actual languages, not gibberish, not syllables pieced together as some people do today and call it some type of angelic language. Thanks, Brother Webster. Our next uh, question for Brother Lemons, but before we do that, we've reached the halfway point of our program today and we want to offer to you a free tract. The tract that we're offering today, as we did last week, Hearing God in the 21st Century. If you'd like this free tract, or if you'd like to receive our Bible Correspondence Course, written by, incidentally, Brother Alan Webster, brother of Brother Wade Webster, our panelist today, uh, we'd like to send that to you. It's excellent. All of our materials are free on a Bible Answer, so just contact us. You can write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net or you can call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463. For any of our materials or to send us your question, please contact us. You can also contact us by means of our website. Uh, we have a contact page there and a lot of people do that. Our web address is www.abibleanswertv.com. Now back to our questions, that next question for Brother Lemons. Brother Lemons, the person writes, What did Jesus mean when he referred to the leaven of the Pharisees in Mark 8, 15? Brother Lemons. I was just teaching a class this past Wednesday night on the book of Leviticus, chapter 2. We're studying that book. And this passage is one of the ones that I put up on the screen as we were studying passages that contain the word leaven. And uh, so it's interesting to me that that verse would come to me today. But um, in Mark chapter 8, verse 15, we read these words, And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Uh, if we would look up, for, look up a definition of this word leaven, James Hastings in his uh, Dictionary of Christ in the Gospels puts it this way. He says, uh, the fermentation produced by leaven was regarded as a species of putrefaction, and this, together with the tendency of leaven to spread, explains the figure in which the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees stands for their corrupt teaching. Uh, now, the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 6, instead of using the leaven of Herod, uses the leaven of the Sadducees, as we'll point out here in just a minute. But the, the leaven of Herod uh, similarly denotes the policy of the Herodian party. So uh, Albert Barnes in his commentary suggests that the Herodians were distinguished for their irreligion, their sensuality, and their corrupt living. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 6 combines Pharisees and Sadducees uh, in the, his record of this warning that Jesus gave. We want to know what, what was Jesus trying to communicate by using this word leaven uh, in giving a warning to his disciples. Well, you know, there's a close connection, even though these two parallels are different, Matthew and Mark, uh, Sadducees in one place, Herod in another. Uh, there was a close connection between the Sadducees sect of the Jews and the Herodians. Uh, the Sadducees were the party from which most of the high priests came. And so there was a, a, a relying on one another. They were closely associated together. They, the, the Sadducees were interested in maintaining their position of power and uh, they felt like maintaining a close connection to the Herodians would uh, uh, guarantee them the, uh, the high priesthood. And so uh, likely Jesus warned about all three of these groups. Uh, as he made that, that statement. On the surface, uh, if we know anything about these different sects of the Jews, uh, I'm sure that you have read about them, maybe have looked up uh, 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 some information about them, but uh, we might think it's strange that Jesus would uh, warn, combine a warning about the Pharisees who were very moral people, religious, they lived by a moral code, and the Herodians who were so worldly and not religious at all and not interested, the only interest they had was in secular power. Even though the two might be quite different, they are uh, alike in a lot of ways, 
and that is that they uh, really they're more alike than they are different because they both are reliant upon human forces in order to maintain their power. And that seems to be the thing that they were the most interested in was they didn't want to lose their power. And uh, they both covet greatly power and they made a lot of decisions based upon what they felt like would help them to maintain their power. Sadly, the disciples didn't seem to understand the warning that Jesus was giving because if you read in verse 16, it says, They reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread. Jesus wasn't using the word leaven uh, in that way. He was using it in a figurative sense. It is of grave importance that God's people take care about their associations. Such a danger uh, in our attempt to live for Christ if we're influenced by others who take us in a wrong direction away from the ethical standard that we find in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, the Apostle Paul wrote, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. The New King James Version has it, Be not deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. So uh, we're also told in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, by the Apostle John, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. The, the influence and the teaching and the leaven of others affects us greatly. We need to be so careful about that. The leaven of which Jesus gave warning in Mark chapter 8, and verse 15, was, the, was powerful and it was spreading. And that's why he used the word leaven. Leaven in, in certain ingredients causes it to grow and that's the uh, uh, impact of that figure that Jesus used here. Uh, the, if they uh, were influenced by the evil uh, of those two different sects of the Jews, all three of them actually, then it's going to be more difficult for them, to, for them to preach the gospel and to save lost souls, which would be the activity that the Lord's disciples ought to be involved in. So that's a great question. We, uh, uh, those figures of speech that are used in the Bible are very interesting. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Brother Lemons, for that good answer. Our next question to Brother Harib. Brother Harib, why are many Christians who were raised by their parents with a God-centered biblical worldview now rejecting it and accepting the self-centered secular worldview so prominent in our culture? Brother Harib. That is a great question, and the reality is we are losing a lot of our young people. A lot of our young people have wandered off into the world and have left the church. The bottom line is darkness does not like the light. Let me begin by answering this question by reading to you 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. The Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. It, it has been a, a long time in our country since school days were started by things like prayer, the Pledge of Allegiance. There are a, a few scattered schools that, that will still do this, but the reality is most places don't allow prayer anymore. They don't allow Bible reading anymore. So there's obviously a component that has been removed from our children's education. Now add to that the very real fact that almost all textbooks are built on the ideal of humanism. That, that is that realistically there is no God but rather that man is at the top. Now if you doubt the fact that textbooks are centered around humanism just ask yourself a simple question. Where is God mentioned in those textbooks. And the reality is I think we would all admit that God's not allowed in the textbooks. We, we have this false notion of separation of church and state today and so again kids are not hearing the prayer, they're not hearing Bible reading in school, they're not saying things like the Pledge of Allegiance, but oh now you add to that the fact that the text that they're learning from is totally devoid of God. And so we start to understand why these young people would develop a secular worldview rather than one that is focused solely around Almighty God. The reality is they're not hearing about God. The media is absolutely against anything religious and most definitely against Christianity. Now I want to throw a couple of other things in there just to get you thinking. I also believe that affluence 
has probably done quite a bit of damage to Christianity in the United States of America. I've had the opportunity to, to travel all over the world, and one of the things that I see is in areas that are not as affluent as America, people are a whole lot more receptive. Not just affluence, entertainment. Consider the, the life of a young person who grows up and by age four, five, six years of age, they're already playing video games, they, they've got iPads and iPhones and all kinds of gadgets, and they are very used to living in a, a world of entertainment. And sadly, they go into a, a worship setting and they view that as, as boring or, or sterile. They, they haven't developed a reverence for God. And so, again, Sadly, we see people wanting to try to bring entertainment into worship to please themselves. Another thing that I would toss out is many of our young people, they don't believe that the Bible, that Christianity is relevant in their lives. And this one I'm actually going to throw at the feet of the parents because I think far too often parents do not live the life. 24-7. Instead, it's a, a Sunday morning, Sunday night kind of ordeal, Wednesday night. The reality is our children need to realize that everything focuses on that, that hub of Jesus Christ. Without that, our, our kids are going to think, you know, what, what difference does this make? I, I'm here to go to college, get a great job, get money, get lots of things. Okay, well, that's success from the world's perspective. We've got to step back and we've got to ask ourselves, are we teaching our children true success? That is, getting to heaven. A couple of more items I would throw out as far as people leaving the church, why the church is in the state that it's in. The church has become very apathetic today. Now, we've got a lot of members who are basically sitting in pews, but that's about all they're doing is sitting in pews. Uh, I asked the question to men all across our country, you know, what do you think is the biggest problem we're facing today? The number one answer that I get on a routine basis is lack of Bible knowledge. The bottom line is we don't know the book the way previous generations did. And so, you know, when you start adding all this up, you look at what they're learning in school, you look at, at all of the different things that are affecting them, whether it be affluence, whether it be materialism, all of that goes into a pile, and, and we see that our children, they have wandered and drifted onto the broad way. They're, they're not on that narrow path. Great question. Very good answer, Brother Harold. We appreciate that very much because it focuses in on some of the problems that we're facing. Our next question to Brother Webster. Brother Webster, it is being taught that when Jesus discusses putting away, in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, and Matthew 19, 9, he's not referring to divorce, but to separation. They say there are two different Hebrew words in the Old Testament and two different Greek words in the New Testament, one for putting away without a writing of divorcement, and then divorce the actual ending of a marriage. They claim that Malachi 2, 16 does not say God hates divorce, but that God hates separation even without a divorce, that's a long question, but they say, can you please discuss this? Brother Webster. I think it's interesting that one of the verses that was referenced in this was Matthew chapter 5 and verses 31 and 32. Uh, that's found in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And in Max Matthew chapter 5, Jesus uses an expression again and again. And the expression is this, Ye have heard, but I say. Jesus was contrasting what they had heard with what the truth really was. And there are many things that we might hear today that might fall short of the truth. What we need to do is to hear Jesus. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5 says that we are to hear Him. We need to understand that one day it is His Word that will judge us. John said, Jesus said, according to John's record, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And so rather than listening to what men say, we need to listen to what Jesus says because He's the judge and it's His Word that will one day judge us. Now there's reference made in this question to some Hebrew words and some Greek words and that may make you and me as well uncomfortable because we're not as familiar with those languages as we would like to be. But I want you to understand that the words that are used are used interchangeably. 
both in the Hebrew and in the Greek. And you don't have to understand those words to know that. In Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees come to Jesus and they ask him a question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? You'll see there that they said put away. That's one of these words. Jesus will go on to explain to them that from the beginning this was not so. And he would tell them that what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Then they would come back and they would say, but didn't Moses command a writing of divorcement? So there's the other word that's being used. And in that verse, they also refer to putting away. In the Pharisees' mind, there was no difference between putting away and the writing of divorcement. In the mind of Jesus, there was no difference between those two things. In the mind of the disciples who were hearing this, there was no difference in those two things. The, this questioner, the person who, who came up with this idea about the Greek words and the Hebrew words, was suggesting the fact that Jesus was stretching the reasons for divorce. That as long as it was legally obtained, that it was approved of God. That's not the case. And the disciples did not believe that either. They saw Jesus' teaching as narrow because they said, if this is the case, then it's better not to marry. Jesus explained the same in saying that not all men could abide by this teaching. And so the context makes very clear that these words are used interchangeably. There's one reason, according to God, and that is except it be for fornication. Thank you so much for this question. Thanks to each of our brethren for doing such a great job today in answering your questions. You know, one of the reasons why there's so many marital problems today is because people fail to bury the hatchet. A lack of forgiveness. The Indians back in New England, they had this different means of ending conflict. They would meet with their enemies, dig a deep hole on the battlefield, take two hatchets, put them in the hole and cover them up. And everyone loved the peace that followed. And that's the origin of the phrase, bury the hatchet. Is there someone with whom you need to make peace today? Why not get on with that? A word of apology, a note of confession, a peace offering gift even to a spouse can accomplish the same thing today as bearing hatchets did then. In Romans 12 and verse 18, the Bible says, If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably, peaceably, with all men. We want to encourage you today, as they did then, to bury the hatchet, forgive one another. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.